สวัสดีนะครับวันนี้ก็เป็นโครงการกิจกรรมครั้งแรกนะครับของโครงการของสโมสรนิสิตนะครับโครงการของเราครั้งนี้ก็คือโครงการไทยกลาหรือว่าภาษาอังกฤษก็คือ Beyond Boundaries เราจะพานิสิตนะครับแล้วก็ผู้สนใจทั้งหลายไปท่องเที่ยวในองค์ความรู้ดินแดนองค์ความรู้ต่างๆประเด็นทางสังคมต่างๆที่น่าสนใจในสถานการณ์ร่วมสมัยตอนนี้ที่ไม่ใช่ในประเทศไทยแต่ว่าเป็นทั่วโลกเลยนะครับครั้งนี้ก็เป็นครั้งแรกเราจะคุยกับนักวิชาการนะครับแล้วก็เป็นนักเคลื่อนไหวที่ทํางานเกี่ยวกับประชาธิปไตยเบลารุสเป็นคนที่รณรงค์เรื่องสิทธิของอประชาชนเบลารุสในการที่จะโค่นล้มเผด็จการนะครับแล้วก็มีการเลือกตั้งที่เสรีอันนี้ก็เป็นปรากฏการณ์ที่น่าสนใจมากเป็นสิ่งที่เกิดขึ้นพร้อมๆกับเรียกว่าการต่อสู้ในประเทศไทยของเราเลยแต่ว่าคนไทยอาจจะไม่รู้เท่าไหร่นะครับโอเคเดี๋ยวผมก็จะเราจะดําเนินรายการเป็นภาษาอังกฤษทั้งหมดนะครับครั้งนี้นะครับแล้วเราก็จะมีการสรุปประเด็นเป็นภาษาไทยอีกทีหนึ่งนะครับเพื่อเผยแพร่ให้ผู้ผู้ฟังชาวไทยนะครับผู้อ่านชาวไทยได้ได้ทราบครับครับก็เดี๋ยวจะเชิญวิทยากรของเราเข้ามาในรายการแล้วก็จะเริ่มดําเนินรายการเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับครับโอเคโอเคอืมอืมฮัลโหลอืมเนติวิทย์เดอะพรีซิเดนต์ของอืมพลิติคอลไซส์สตูเดนต์ยูเนียนจุฬาลงกรณ์ยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้อืมเวอร์วอร์มเวลคัมส์ทูยูไกส์ทูอัลเวอร์สเปอร์สอัลอัลซีรีส์บิยอนบาวด์เรสทูอัลดิสเยียร์วิลอินไวส์สปีกเกอร์สราวด์เดอะเวอร์พลิติชิเอนส์อะคาเดมิกส์อืม Activists to talk about the various issues that affect us that beyond our borders. This is our first episode, and we have now um, Nicholas James, PhD student from Oxford University, to talk about um, the situation in Belarus. As we saw it, as now the protest is uh, growing as well as the uh, violations of human rights. There. And um, I want to know that how it came to this point where it will go and what the future of Belarus. This session, uh, I have a moderator, um, Mr. Supanat. He is the second year student and the head of academic affair of our student union to uh, to moderate. Uh, okay, let's start um, the session. Uh, James, apart from your academic Background. You are also campaigning in Change.org to call uh, academic community to support Belarusian people fighting for democracy. You make a clip video featuring many academics as well as uh, inviting me and student activists uh, around the world to help Belarus. I'm very curious that um, you are very active on this. Uh, I want to know that how you. Uh, first place in first place come to be involved uh, about Belarusian causes. Yeah, sure. And I just want to thank you first for inviting me to talk today and for helping to raise awareness about Belarus to Thai audiences. So in terms of why I, I'm so active in this sphere, um, I'm primarily a scholar of authoritarianism and national identity in post-Soviet Europe. And what is happening in Belarus, much like in Ukraine in, say, 2013, is a prime motivator of my research agenda. And I believe that we need to understand the positives and negatives found in these national movements to, faci to facilitate the transition to democracy and create consolidated forms of democratic governance. This is possible through fostering civic national movements, such as what is occurring in Belarus right now. And these movements cross-cut cleavages and create long lasting forms of civil society. But I'm also connected to the country and broader region by my mom's side of the family who are Belarusian and Ukrainian. Uh, they come from just south of Brest and, and north of uh, Kovol in Ukraine. And this isn't even to mention the Russian side. Um, so I grew up learning from the children of immigrants who fled one authoritarian regime and who held complex and, and mixed national identities, not quite Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, or Polish, but a, but a mixture of each, which then turned into an American identity. 
So I'm very grounded to my roots in the region, which almost mimic this complex interplay of layered identities there. Hmm. Okay, so I think let's start talking about the various political uprising in uh, in general. Can you explain us um, what's happening in Belarus in brief, like for for the Thai audience to understand more? Because as we might not know the context about the Western European countries and uh, uh, Eastern sorry Eastern U European countries, and also how did the movements start and what's the trigger of this movement? Yeah, so this is this is a pretty big question, um, but I, I think I can quickly note the background of the current protests and the state of the regime. Okay. In 1994, Alexander Lukashenko came into the presidency and, and established a self-titled authoritarian regime, which continued the practices of the Soviet Union, albeit on a miniature level. Included in this style of government are harsh repressions where political opposition is violently suppressed. It's fair to say that elections in Belarus are neither free nor fair. And Lukashenko regularly receives around 80% of the votes. It's also one of the least free places in the world uh, for the press. And it ranks 157th out of 180 for press freedom. Uh, I think Thailand for reference is about 130th on that list. Yeah. Now, Western and Russian observers often assumed that the people of Belarus were deferent and, and they exchanged democratic governance in return for its stability. And in fact, Belarus has been one of the most economically stable post-Soviet states under Lukashenko. So this seemed to make some intuitive sense. Um, and that really happened due to his knack of playing Western states off of Russia to secure loans. Yeah. Um, and it's also due to the state-centered industry, such as potash, which is an ex um, essential component of fertilizers. And then there's also uh, petrochemicals there as well. However, these observers who are very keen on, on uh, looking at the economy and, and a lack of democratic governance seldom are based in Minsk, and they sometimes miss the plot with uh, understanding public opinion. The real issue with Belarusian national identity and democracy is not uh, a lack of um, believing in the country, but rather it's a regime level um, series of repressions against any sort of politics at all. Protests, in fact, have undergirded society multiple times, yet the past two months have been the largest and most prolonged ever. So how did we end up here? In short, the presidential campaign season was one of the most lively uh, of all time, for a lack of better words. Sergei Tikhonovsky was a prominent critic, um, and he was running for president, and he was then arrested and barred from running um, in typical anti-political opposition fashion. So his wife, Svetlana, took his place and created a movement behind her. She was simply a woman trying to get her husband back from the regime, and that was a large part of her platform. And before the campaign, she, like many other Belarusians, was not particularly active in, in the political sphere. During the campaign, though, the state harassed her and threatened her children, yet she stood in defiance. Her main political platform was to create free and fair elections, a constitutional referendum on presidential term limits, and to release all political prisoners, including her husband. She attracted tens of thousands to her rallies across the country, which were the largest since the 1990s. And so you can see why Lukashenko became worried about this. So in response, the regime rigged the election and gave her only 10% of the votes. In reality, though, she probably had upwards of 60 to 70 percent of all votes in the country. She was then forced to flee to Lithuania amid fears of imprisonment while the protest movement broke out across the country. Other opposition members were also made and forced to leave the country as well. So Tikhonovskaya created a coordination council to transfer power from Lukashenko. Members included the Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexeyevich, who you guys might know from the HBO series uh, Chernobyl and her books, obviously. Yeah. Um, 
And last week, the European Parliament actually recognized the, the coordinated Coordination Council as the interim representation of Belarus, and they will go on further today and next week to um, make that more permanent. I can also turn to a week-by-week -week summary of the protest to show how they've evolved and go over the triggers for everything that's happened. Yes. Now, the main trigger for these original protests was the rigged election and the treatment and harassment of Tikhonovskaya. During the August 9th to 15th protests, the first week, Tikhonovskaya was detained by the Central Election Committee and then forced to flee the country amid threats. Protesters took to the street at night and followed tactics similar to the Hong Kong Be Water tactics. Um, and the government then used extreme force on the protesters using rubber bullets, beatings and torture, water cannons, gas, and flashbang grenades. Citizens were in fact killed in the streets by the riot police during this period. Hmm. At the same time, protesters were detained and tortured. And we now have over 400 documented cases of torture during detainment, of which the content's probably too disturbing to talk about here. Um, but we know that the numbers are higher than this as well. These are just people who came forward. And this brutality fueled the, the protest fire, so to speak, as students, young people, workers, and old people alike returned home with broken limbs, amputations, and worse. The regime attempted to quell the protests during this week with extreme mafia-style violence and instead created more protesters. And these early actions then led to strikes across the country and international outrage. The second week saw reports of over 76 people disappeared. And this means that people who were not brought into prison uh, and were not accounted for after the protests, they're still, many of them are still missing. Workers at state enterprises were fired for demonstrating and country level strikes went on and expanded. Leaders of these strikes were then arrested. And so Human Rights Watch noted that the police roundups of protesters were systematically brutal. This week also saw uh, a, a great development of, of the women's marches, which have been a, a weekly tradition now. And Maria Kolesnikova, who was one of the uh, three women, uh, two women alongside Tikhonovsky during the campaign season, uh, actually addressed the crowd during that march. She is now imprisoned. The third week saw 250,000 people, or around three to four percent of the country, march in Minsk. Lukashenko actually uh, grabbed a gun and fled one of his palaces via helicopter with his son, both of them brandishing uh, Kalashnikovs. <laughs> um, so he it became the third week is kind of a turning point to showing the the erratic tendencies of the regime, because that's obviously crazy. Now, the fourth week saw students arrested on their own campuses at Minsk State Linguistic University for singing songs from uh, Les Mis. Riot police stormed the campus and brutally detained these students. And they were in fact allowed to by the, the rector of the university. And this prompted my letter of solidarity. Uh, we saw these events happening and nobody in the international um, academic community, aside from in Ukraine, Poland, and Germany was saying anything. And I thought an English language letter might help. And this was also the week where we saw Navalny get poisoned in, in Russia, which uh, is seemingly unrelated, but nobody knows. The fifth week held a march of unity with over 200,000 participants. Armored personnel during this time unwound barbed wire around the independent square. And this is the first time uh, I, I think in anyone's memory where this has happened, um, maybe World War II would be a, an, another uh, example. Police again used extreme violence and ramped it up and started to ramp it up again. During this week, Kolesnikova was abducted by masked men. They drove her to the border of Ukraine and attempted to forcibly deport her, to exile her from the country. Instead, she jumped outside of the car window, tore up her passport, so she couldn't legally leave the country and Ukraine couldn't legally accept her. The regime then arrested her. And then they exiled the remaining members of the Coordination Council, except for Alexeyevich, who will leave um, 
uh, this past week. The sixth week held a hero's march in Minsk. So every week they name the march and they, and they theme it. I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, and the sixth week held the hero's march, which again, police used mass detentions and used extreme violence, including an instance of shooting a gun in the air. Over 700 people were detained on the 13th of September and at Minsk State Linguistic University, access control was introduced at the university and solidarity actions were carried out by students and teachers across the university system. So from here, you get a real consolidation of student groups actually. And I think that from the 9th of September onwards, there's a, a decent beginning of student groups forming, um, which is really um, promising and inspiring to see. Now, the seventh week, 100,000 people gathered in Minsk among increased police presence and soldiers. And on the 23rd of September, Lukashenko illegally swore himself in as president. This brought about mass opposition where protesters began to use confrontational ta tactics, such as blocking roadways. Now, last Sunday, uh, week eight, now we're in week eight, over 100,000 protesters again rallied in Minsk. And this week we have a lot of developments on the international stage as Lukashenko illegally swore himself in, now countries are feeling safe to start speaking out because that action was illegal. And that's where we are. You're muted. Thank you so like, mm -hmm. thank you for your like, brief like for, your, for the situation in Belarus so it's for me as a Thai um it's like what's happening in Thailand like um, we have kind of protests like for the past few months few months and like um the the trigger is like the disso dissolution of, of the future forward party. of the progressive yeah. party like future forward party which is which is the opposition party in Thailand in the early of this year and yeah but sadly, the COVID came and uh, the, the movement kind of disrupted. But mm -hmm. in in the past two to three months, the movement started again. Mm -hmm. started again. And yeah, just want to know more about the, like, the background and the context of Belarus. Why Lukashenko, Lukashenko right? Um, why, why can't he, like, go on for so long for, like, Decades, twenty years, thirty years, and has that the, there is a nickname like the Europe last dictator, right? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, well, Lukashenko created an extreme personalist dictatorship. He the power in Belarus is only um, channeled through him, and he was able to do this over successive years of, of bargaining with different elites, uh, not liberalizing the market where. And you, if you compare it to Ukraine, Ukraine um, let the market up and it created different factions, but yeah. that's not possible in Belarus where everything is still state-centered. So he's kind of the, the way to get ahead, um, mm. much like personalist dictators everywhere. So he was just able to retain power and he's really tricky at uh, switching up security personnel, switching up the interior ministries. Um, and, and ensuring that he only has loyalists, loyalists in charge of those. And in that way, he's able to retain power even with this huge uh, deficit of legitimacy. Mm. Okay. Um, so let's come back to like talk about, discuss about the movement in the Belarus. Um, like um, just wanna know like for now, what are the challenges of, of the movement currently? Like what they have to do more to, in order to like, you know, like destroy it. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm speaking here as an outsider, just to make this clear. Um, I'm not on the ground protesting in yeah. Belarus and it takes a lot of courage to do so. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that from, at least from our standpoint over here, I, I, I can talk. So for me and for, the, the international community, I think that the largest challenge protesters face is of course, violence and state repressions. Keeping up the pressure on the regime 
is of prime concern, especially as most opposition leaders are now in exile or under arrest. However, yeah. there's no sign that enthusiasm is dwindling. So the real challenge is outlasting the regime long enough to drain its resources, especially as the West has now finally begun to sanction key members of the regime, including Lenk Lukashenko. Uh, the UK and Canada just in fact invoked um, Magnitsky sanctions on him. Hmm. Now, I doubt that anybody will give up the feeling of freedom now that they're on its cusp, and there are pra but there are practical challenges facing them, especially with those who have become jobless or repressed at work or university. Teachers, for instance, have been fired alongside minors and other critical state workers. So these groups need to be supported, and there, there are actually support groups for them. Um, but another challenge is getting the elite to finally back the protest, which is difficult amid firings and violence. Um, a, a key step of this is making the security elite finally reject Lukashenko. Now, one um, telegram channel and media outlet called Necta has been leaking the names of all of the riot police officers, about a thousand every couple of days. And just uh, last week, when they released 3,000 names, at least a thousand of them applied for the assistance um, fund for people who want to get out of the state government uh, employment. So actions like that are, are very helpful in, in really splitting the elite. But I, I think I can um, adapt a list from a list of steps necessary to challenge the dictatorship. Um, so a, a lot of this stuff is actually from work on the Balkans, uh, especially people like Florian Bieber. And, and some of these steps that I'm going to list have been com completed, yet others are to be realized. So first, challenging traditional authoritarian rule can get can garner mass support under the right circumstances. And certainly in Belarus, it does have that. Yeah. Yet it has to remain peaceful to sustain external legitimacy. And this is extremely difficult regarding police detentions and brutality. This step is ongoing but the people of Belarus are really showing their resolve and courage in facing the regime with um, the kind of ingenuity and, and creativity that they're showing during these protests. Second, Lukashenko must be caught in the act doing something illegal, which he has been. He clearly falsified the election, supported the brutality of the riot police, and continues to exploit state workers. Third, prove that Lukashenko does not have a silent majority. This is proven every Sunday, I think. For the past two months, hundreds of thousands of people have been protesting against the regime, some for the first time ever. They're not just urbanites or students, but miners, faculty, farmers, and more. And this step is really essential in showing that the entire of society is in solidarity together. And in that line, the fourth step is to create a public sphere which is off of the internet. By this, I mean when people can connect face to face. This has happened every single day during the protest, from singing in metros and marketplaces to nightly courtyard meetings, which are full of dance and, and song and pride and sometimes food. <laughs> and, and this is an essential step in creating a de-atomized society, full not only of individuals who, who are usually easily manipulated to the whims of the regime, but of a collective whole, which is much more unwavering. Hmm. Fifth, offer an alternative. Now, Tikhanovskaya's platform of free and fair elections is the best alternative possible. It creates a new start. The people believe in it, it has mass support, and it offers viable change. Sixth, do not engage with him on his terms. He will try and show that these protesters are, are rabble-rousers, rioters, not full Belarusians in some way like him. They're, they're from Poland or something. Now, every day, the protests show just the opposite. They're the ones who pick up the trash and clean the streets that the police ruin. Oh. Seventh, pick a winnable battle. Now, this battle is winnable, and the protests are on the right side, but this step is also ongoing as uh, conditions change and the international community becomes more involved. Eight, win an election. I, I know it sounds uh, kind of superficial, but it's true. Now, 
by independent accounts and the international state system, Tikhonovsky did win the election. So I think this step is satisfied. Ninth. Now, this is where I, I'm going to talk about the, the internationalization of, of the uh, regime society conflict, because it's very important considering um, their, their Russian neighbor. Yeah. Protesters have to block the anti and pro-Russian card. Lukashenko will try and align Russia with him and shift the attention from the incipient nation building project. Don't mm -hmm. let him cajole the Russian authorities and attempt to create an authoritarian pan-national. Russia's not inherently against change and to alienate them is to support Lukashenko in some form or another. Russia cannot be left out of the equation here as the West can't either. Now, this brings us to a key um, and related step. Uh, De-internationalization of the regime society polarization is necessary. Of this, I mean that the external legitimacy of Lukashenko must be challenged in his two main supporters, Russia and China. His main power base and legitimacy now comes from this external legitimacy. And international silence is, in fact, which allow, allowed the regime to continue its brutal repressions throughout September. The international community needs to fully back the protests. And by international community, I mean Russia and China as well. <laughs> Lest Lukashenko instrumentally use Western support to cajole Russia's hand as he has been doing and as he is an expert in doing since the 90s. This link has to be severed. And the only way to do that is to at least keep the table open for Russia, as uh, people like Kolesnikova have been saying. So I, th I think that those are my 10 steps to in ensuring a, um, a, a positive protest movement. And there are also the challenges as well. All right. Um, yeah, you have mentioned about the, like, kind of, like, international like intervention or influence on the various right um yeah in thailand there's like kind of discourse about the western in intervention western meddling like are there kind of this discourse and our narratives going around among like belarusians also like kind of yeah so yeah, I, I, I can uh, talk about some of the media in Belarus, the West, and Russia. Uh, I, I'm more of a Russia expert here in, in terms of media oh. discourse, but I, I can talk about um, the West. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so Western support is the only international support backing the protests. Yeah. This is because Russia has been reluctant to fully back Lukashenko, but is also obstinate in not supporting the protest movements because of its own domestic issues. Belarus may be a, a positive or negative example depending on who you are in Russia. Um, so this dynamic has created something of a, a Western push or, or, or coup discourse, at least in Russian language and some ill-informed Western media. This is, it's of course, not true, and the EU is still reluctant to fully back the movement, only coming to um, really terms with it this week uh, with uh, Tikhonovsky meeting Macron, and she is going to meet Merkel. But yeah. there has been a consistent Cypriot veto on all of these actions. And in fact, today, uh, Lukashenko sent the president of Cyprus a little note. He's like, happy Independence Day, brother. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can see that Europe is not really um, a cohesive whole right here. Mm. Uh, we all, I'm also not going to get into the lack of um, awareness by Donald Trump on this. All right. <laughs> he, he's uh, he's not kind of different on many, many issues, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but Biden has actually come out against the uh, dictatorship. So yeah. fingers crossed. Uh, <laughs> Um, and early on, the only European support from the EU, at least, was Lithuania and Poland. Um, and Ukraine has also been helpful in, in more ways than one. But mm. anecdotally, uh, protesters don't care that much as long as they're seen. 
they want to be heard, they want to be understood. So it doesn't matter which state recognizes that, it just matters that a state recognizes their plight. So anecdotally, um, they also don't care that much about Russia as time goes on. And this is a country which is actually pretty pro-Russian on, on the public opinion level. Oh. So dur during the other day, um, during a rally, a Russia mm. Today crew was filming, and, and Russia Today is a, a propagandistic outlet, and protesters told them to actually just leave. They, they said, get out of here, we don't want you. Because oh. Russia Today was actually supporting the... Um, Belarusian state uh, TV services after the um, the news people went on strike. So RT reporters filled it in and started up the news running again. And obviously that news is pro uh, Lukashenko. So I, I mean, I'm not gonna say that pro-Russian and anti-Russian discourse is not really a thing, but it's not a, a large thing here. But the longer that Lukashenko remains in power, the more credence an anti-Russian sentiment gains. And it's mm. equally true for pro-Western sentiments. The longer he remains in power, the, the more positive pro-Western sentiments are going to be because we back them. Now, this is a dynamic that we also saw during the Euromaidan in Ukraine. The, it's the exact same thing in terms of sentiments towards Russia and the West. So, I, I mean, Western support has been legitimizing for Tikhonovskaya. I mean, she met with Merkel, she, uh, Macron, she, she will meet with Merkel. And, and in this way, the protesters themselves have become the legitimate voice of Belarus in the eyes of the international community. However, as the international community is polarized over this, it will entrench Lukashenko further until a broader consensus is reached. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, as in Thailand, uh, the COVID-19 had played a very important role, I think that, you know, to uh, to make many people aware of their instability, economic instability. And uh, the government, I think they also try to use uh, COVID-19, you know, emergency law that uh, people should not go to protect like that. So I want to ask, I wonder that in Belarus, how uh, COVID-19 play the role in protest. Yeah, so this is actually a story about the presidential election as well. Um, Belarus is one of the only countries that did not shut down. <laughs> uh, Lukashenko just, he said, no, we're not gonna shut down. You can go to uh, the, the dacha and have some vodka. He literally prescribed vodka for it. This is concerning for everyone who's on the internet. <laughs> uh, so everyone was like, well, that's insane. Um, you might remember that during March and April, the Belarusian football uh, league was the only league being played so in England. People became like bait fans and stuff. <laughs> they had their own teams. Um, but yeah, the, there is nothing... Um, done about COVID, and this actually fueled a lot of, of anti-Lukashenko sentiment because people are saying, why aren't you doing anything about this massive thing here? And that's because actually the economy is weaker than, um, than it looks. And if they disrupted that, they would be in, in a lot of trouble very soon. Now, during the protests, he ironically started to enact some of these laws against mass gatherings uh, using COVID sometimes as a uh, legitimizing um, yeah. thing, which is obviously hypocritical. Um, and yeah, yeah, just that that's kind of the state of COVID in the country. It's used as an instrumental political tool. Mm. Okay, so yeah, the story of COVID nineteen is kind of similar everywhere for the authoritarian yeah. regime, yeah. you know, <laughs> legitimizing the action. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, like, just wanna like elaborate more on like international influence. Um. Uh. As you like, as you um try to like gain the support from like um activists around the world. I just wanted to know, I just want to know that what's what is the importance 
to gain the international support from from like civil society like you like him mm. okay <laughs> um like some people in Thailand they just you know like what's what's the point of this you know like yeah some, uh, so is it impactful like yeah I think that I I mean we we have to realize that foreign support has been relatively small for the protest movement itself. And while countries have begun since August to support the Belarusian people, this support typically ends at their own borders. So, mm. I mean, Belarusian funding laws, for instance, are very difficult to get around and international funds may be declared as undeclared income if, if a given protester is able to secure them. And this makes giving any money to the country very difficult because it can be taken away. It can be used as a reason to repress somebody. So there's a lot of concerns and, and um, considerations that have to be taken into account in supplying foreign aid here. But that being said, um, the diaspora community and many countries with post-communist experience have come out and shown their solidarity in tangible ways. So um, mm. there are visa, open visa regimes, uh, scholarships, um, easier ways to get over the border now uh, for Lithuania and, um, and Poland and Ukraine specifically. Mm. Um, but there's also people like me in Ukraine, Germany and elsewhere who have started solidarity campaigns to at least show protesters that they aren't alone, that we stand with them. And my letter, which I'm sure many of the people here have signed, has moved top political scientists, economists, and practitioners to show this their support. And, and this matters. I've fielded many comments from Belarusian students and academics thanking me for this, because everything helps, uh, no matter how seemingly small. When, when you put big names to something and, and they stand behind you, you you feel that weight, really. Um, I think that Tikhanovskaya actually came out yesterday and even said this herself. Um, so at the Oslo Freedom Forum, she said that this year we're united and we feel ourselves like a nation, not a separate people, but a nation. Um, and she, she talks about a lot of this national identity going on here. Um, but in this vein, she called for stronger international so solidarity because while the world is vocal and bears witness to the struggle and the crimes of the regime, it gives purpose and recognition to it. And this means that Belarus is important and that the people are important. And the people are important. In fact, when people give recognition to the people, it gives their cause legitimacy and it gives them a weight to their words which they didn't have before. And this means they're more powerful and they have uh, a reserve of power to draw from, even if some of it is symbolic. You're, you're muted again. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah. so, so I want to ask you about the identity of Belarusians after, like, after uh, maybe the if the situation had changed, yeah. you know, and now I think many people in Belarus are aware of the Russian, yeah. Western, and I think they, they don't care, as you say, they, they want to fight um, as uh, they have the plow of themselves like that. So what what change do you think that um, after the protest or after the succession that the identity of Belarus, what what? something that will be yeah so i i think the identity has changed now for good uh a lot as i th said earlier a lot of western and russian um academics who study national identity have always looked at belarus as the the nation that never was a, a nation that had the potential to develop but never did and this is mainly due to the the soviet regime and then the lukashenko yeah. regime they're always kind of a, a little brother to to Russia, so to speak. However, in the past summer, they've completely flipped that on its head. And this this was surprising for the people who weren't watching it, but not surprising to the people who understood the 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 incipient nation building project that was underway since the end of the Soviet Union. So 
if we look to the future, um, it, what's next for Belarusian identity? I, I think that because Belarusians now express themselves in, in, in national ways on, on a quotidian level, on an everyday level, every day and, and in every way, they, they've done this like never before. It's a national identity is a, a, a glance, it's a feeling and it's a state of being and especially one to not be under that authoritarian foot anymore. Now it's an, an understanding between two people who, that have a simple flag pin of white, red, white, the, the traditional flag, or a song in a marketplace, or a walk down the road, which unites them in a new and inclusive national identity. The only ones who aren't being invited to this new party now are, are those who share in Lukashenko's willful uh, myopia or his inability to see down the road uh, five meters or so. Where he sees a couple of thousand of protesters, there are 9.5 million waiting. Yeah. Um, and I think I also interested um, in uh, your 10, uh, uh, 10 things that uh, you uh, learned from Belarus. Um, I want to ask about the offering alternatives, the offering alternative that you say. Um, if now in the, I want to know that uh, the intellectual atmosphere in Belarus, uh, what they are discussing, what they think about the futures, what the economics that they think that uh, the country should should have um, um, political situ uh, political uh, constitution, something like that. What uh, what the future? Is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of alternatives. Um... The, the discussions right now are mostly um, with foreign governments, uh, but also in the country, there's a lot of discussion among uh, the intelligentsia of what Belarus should look like. Uh, so you have different camps as, as you're going to have, but I think the first and most important one that everyone agrees on is just the possibility of free and fair elections this gives the groundwork for everything without free and fair elections you you can't decide on anything in a democratic way and you can't do that in a in a way which will be satisfying to everyone um but what it comes down to later is how do you deal with the economy the economy yeah. is so state-centered there that it's going to have to go under a series of really serious reforms and this is where discussions come into play and they they aren't really um settled yet because now that we have the examples from russia from poland from ukraine we we have a better understanding about how to transition an economy yet there are serious um issues especially if you look at ukraine and russia which are more similar um, in, in their development than a Western country like Poland or Western or European country like Poland, at least in the EU. Um, so the main thing is to not create an oligarchy. Um, and this means not having the secret deals which undergirded the, the 90s in Russia and in, in Ukraine where factories were sold for next to nothing in US dollars. And then these factories then become global giants. Uh, and <laughs> it also means that the, I, I think another thing that the, um, a lot of people agree on is increasing the role of parliament. Cause right now it's, it's obviously hyper, hyper presidentialism, but if you transition to a democracy, it's, um, not quite like the the united states system where we have an executive which is very powerful but it sort of makes sense in some weird way because we're federalized um, belarus isn't and it will have to grapple with a, a parliamentary system a, a real one and creating that system is what the one of the prime concerns is because right now it's uh, pretty gutted and the the political elite uh, it is quite different than the uh, average person, I would say. So yeah. 
one of the struggles here is how to create a new political elite. And, and I think that this is obviously going to come from many of these student mo movements as it has done elsewhere, um, as it always does. <laughs> so if you look at uh, Taiwan, for example, um, the, uh, the sun, Sunflower Movement, yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah uh, you, you have um, Lin Fei Fan, who became this deputy secretary general of, of his party uh, just five years later. <laughs> yeah. So these uh, kind of um, protests are, are real recruitment pools after a um, political change. Okay, so I think we have asked you about uh, what's next for Belarusians already, but yeah, so I think we let's move to like Q and A session for the audience here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me see. So if anyone wants to ask uh wants to ask questions, you can comment on the Facebook Live or YouTube Live. And yeah, we have already we already have one question here from Kun Pipop Nab. I will show it for you. Can you see his question? Okay, will, there yes. be, will there be or has there been any armed resistance against Lukashenko regime? Where do people in Belarus strongly adhere to nonviolent approaches? Does it have anything to do with their culture? Yeah, I, I do not believe there will be an armed resistance against Lukashenko. Uh, I, I fully do not believe that that is in the cards. You never know, but it, I, I don't think so. Um, the only armed resistance that happened uh, was during uh, one of the first nights of the protests where one Molotov cocktail was, was thrown. Just one. <laughs> um, and that, that was it. Um, sometimes the, the women scream at the riot police but that <laughs> that's about as violent as they really get or, or they they stop a detention from happening um now why do they strongly adhere to nonviolent approaches I, I i think there is a cultural element here um so uh, okay here's a here's a joke it, it's kind of essentializing and, and not really true but it, it's a bit funny uh there a russian sits on a park bench and there's a nail and he sits on the nail and he, and he stands up and he screams some expletives and kicks the bench and leaves <laughs> a ukrainian sits on that same bench there's a nail again he sits on it looks at it takes a nail and leaves <laughs> the, the belarusian sits on the bench says it hurts but maybe it ought to be this way uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's right. a, uh, it's a, obviously a Russian joke, um, <laughs> but it does have a bit of a point here. The, I, I think the nonviolence, it, it's not really a, a national culture thing, but it does stem from years and years and years of brutal repressions. And so there, there isn't like in America, a, a, a culture where, or a political culture, which has allowed violence ever. So it's really a lack of experience with that or as in um, other post-Soviet uh, countries where that has been more normal. Okay, so let's go to the next questions from uh, Kanyanat, right? Um, he, um, what, are the next, what are the next steps the protesters need to do to achieve their goals? This question applies to both Belarus and Thailand. If the protester is Impossible to talk about Thailand too. Yeah, so if we look at historical examples of successful protests in, in um, post-communist Europe, one of the next steps uh, has already been completed, which is to create a coordinating committee. Now, another step with this is to create student societies and create uh, hierarchical forms of governance within those societies, and then they can develop further. Um, but in Belarus, I think a lot of, of things are moving very quickly. So I, I'm, I don't think anyone is, is quite apt to say what the next step should be because we don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. Um, but I think that creating these hierarchical forms of governance and students is essential. They already have these, they have a lot of strike committees in the industries right now, such as the potash industry with Belarus Gali. 
um, such as at the Minsk, Minsk uh, tractor factory, with the best tractors in the world. Um, but the, it, creating these hierarchical forms of governance and showing people how to actually lead themselves is one of the key steps to creating the um, society which uh, can support democracy. Okay. So, okay. So, if anyone wants uh, wants to have want to ask um, Mr. James questions, you can type in the Facebook Live now. I think some people are typing now. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I want to ask you just my personal question. Okay, so um, in Thailand, the people from like LGBT community like are leading the protest right now as like a one like the leader of the free people protest, which is the name of like, free people in Thailand. They are both they are they are LGBT, right? Mm. And we are friends yeah. for a long time, and yeah, and many of like the moderators and the the one who lead the protest are from the LGBT community. And are there any like the similar phenomenon in like in Belarus? And what do you think about it? Yeah. So to um the uh. Similar things. Uh, the the most similar thing is that the the leaders of the Belarusian protest movement are all women, and and women take the lead on everything. There's women separate marches, even the, the, a whole day for women, um, and, and they've really been inspiring, especially as the the brutal detentions were happening, and they were also happening against women. Um, and yet they still came out and they still lead. Uh, people like Kolesnikova have become national heroes or uh, Nina Bak Baginska, is that her name stupid? Uh, <laughs> um, she's this 73-year-old uh, little woman who uh, has been fighting the police, really, just, just showing absolute bravery. She's been detained many times and, and she, she always comes out, yeah. Hmm. I think there's another question in this one that I should answer. Um, from yes. Mr. Pipop, from your Russian anecdote, are you saying the people in Belarus are submissive? Does that have to do with their being subjugated to the dictatorship for a long time? I heard that the country, I heard that the country is deeply entrenched in strong patriarchy. Would this revolution help to advance their gender equality protection? Yeah. So just on the first point. I, I, <laughs> Uh, that's more of the the perception that is from abroad about Belarus. As I was saying during my um, remarks earlier, a lot of people think that um, or, or thought that Belarusians were deferent for these democratic exchanges. Um, but it did for a long time have to do with the amount of, of um, centralized power in the country. So there's a bit, you know, with all humor, there's a, a kernel of truth to it. But um, now, hopefully, and I think it has, this has changed. There, There's no longer anybody sitting back and just allowing things to happen. People are coming to the streets, they're facing the police, and um, they're doing it nonviolently, which is even, it takes, uh, in my opinion, a lot more courage to do so um, when, when you see your friends who, who get amputated or, or lose an eye um, or have been to the torture chambers. Uh, it, it takes a lot of um, personal resolve to do that. So I think they're just showing a, a different way um, forward for a lot of um, protest movements out there. Um, for country deeply entrenched in so strong patriarchy, um, I, I wouldn't say it's deeply entrenched other than Lukashenko as a man. Uh, um, but there are definitely gender norms and um, strong male roles. But also I would um, I, I would dare you to cross a Belarusian woman. <laughs> um, I can give you some numbers to my family. Um, but I do think that the 
revolution will help advance gender equality, not only in Belarus, but, but around the world, because people like Kolesnikova who have been detained or people like Tikhanovskaya who are at this massive international platform now are really showing um, that women have what it takes to to confront a dictatorship one on one, and, and this is this is really cool. Uh, you, you wouldn't even think that this was possible three months ago when she first started running, but just in that small time, she's created a real national movement. Um, and with her, there is hundreds of thousands of women. Okay, thank you. So we have two more questions here. Um, this one is interesting from Mr. Tirapat Arunrat. Um, in Thailand, there is a debate of how the movements should be conducted, whether it is roughly horizontal or vertical. How do the protesters organize themselves in the Belarus? What's your opinion on this? In Belarus, it's really spontaneous organization. So there are some key telegram channels that will say, today is the march of, of uh, unity. And then people will come out and people just come out there there's no real um organization and it's deliberate like that it, it's just like in hong kong with b water in, in terms of um moving around and spontaneously surprising the police in different parts of the city it's the same thing in terms of organization levels um and i think that that is very effective and and is in fact why it the movement has sustained for so long we can see in a lot of top-down movements where key members of the um, opposition will be arrested and then the opposition will fizzle out. But if there are no key members, if the key member is the collective whole, you're, you, there's not much you can do. Mm. Okay. So to yeah. agree on that for <laughs> me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. From Kun Kanyanat again, uh, Mr. Kanyanat. Some might argue about the credibility of the government led or formed by students, whether they are competent enough to lead the country. In this case, how would you explain that the hierarchical government led by students can run a country? Uh, I think we crossed some wires there. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. What I meant earlier was just that students who create hierarchical governance structures in their university, um, in terms of student unions and, and uh, committees. Yeah. These students become a recruitment pool later for the government. And then I provided the, the example of, of Lin Fei Fan, who's famous from uh, yeah. Taiwan. Yeah. And now he's uh, important in his party. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, as, um, okay, we have another question. Yeah, we have another question from from Kun Sum Sum Sipachai. How can hierarchical student student organization or governance work when many of the protesters protest now these days from Thailand to Hong Kong seem to be operating in less organized settings? Are there alternative forms of governance communities that are less in top down? Yeah, so when I mean um hierarchical student organizations, they don't explicitly have to be tied to uh, the protest movement. They just have to be in opposition. Now, there are a lot of ways of doing this in less organized settings. It doesn't have to be, you know, I I'm the president of this committee and we're all going to talk in a Socratic circle. Uh, <laughs> it can be very informal structures that plan things, or it can be very in informal structures that garner international support in some way or another, or, or funding, or different ways of um, providing opposition. And it can also provide support to the protests in ways which are um, maybe you wouldn't really expect them to. So by that, I mean, say, say that there's a protest going on a committee of students can come together and say, okay, we're going to uh, do some sort of civic engagement with this protest. We're going to clean the street. Take that away from the regime. The regime doesn't get to do it. We get to do it because we are proud of our streets or give water to people or provide aid or 
you know, there, there's a lot of different um, options to do in regards to d the direct um, protest movements. Um, and then alternative forms of governance here that are less top down are <laughs> you can make uh, cells, um, so different uh, committees, right, that aren't connected to each other so that if one goes down, they all don't go down. Um, but that would be a very uh, extreme case, I, I, I think, and probably not necessary. Yeah. I think we should be okay. Okay. Oh, maybe uh, this is the last, last question. question. Um, okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. And I want to ask you that um, as a Thai people, we maybe don't, don't know much about Belarus. Maybe you can suggest some book about Belarus. And also, if you want to follow the situation, uh, maybe in English, uh, what, the, what the channel that uh, we, can, we can learn? Sure. So books on Belarus, there are, are plenty of um, good ones. However, I would just, instead of um, giving you academic books, which are boring, I recommend <laughs> you just read uh, Alexeyevich. Just read all of her work. <laughs> really, I, I'm not kidding. She's a, a, a genius. Um, she won the Nobel Prize <laughs> for being a genius in, in literature. But they're also they are nonfiction. So this is an important um, resource to turn to for Belarus, and you'll probably be much happier reading that than some dull Harvard University Press. <laughs> um, and then in other, um, what was the second part of your question? Uh, oh, channels, channels, yes. Uh, so the best one by far um, is on Twitter and you can follow them. They are Nekta. And so you can spell N-E-X-T-A. Um, yes, Nekta. These guys are the best and the, their handle is Nekta underscore TV. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you guys for um, bringing me here today. It, it was an honor to help inaugurate this series. Yeah, it's a okay. really honor of us to have you today. And maybe next time we we would like to invite you again. Sure, sure. Yeah. To update the situation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we hope. Uh, the yeah, situation hope. is continue to be promising. Yeah. In those. Yeah, hopefully the government changes and I can come here with a different speech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for today. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Too late, man. Ah, so job in a kang ni. Diao ko. Tao jap. Ko da kopun ma na kap. Sama pu kam tham. Pi song ko ma. Lao ko. Diao da jam ni kang na tao pai ko. คอยติดตามอัปเดตนะครับแล้วก็เดี๋ยวจะมีทําสรุปด้วยเป็นภาษาไทยให้สําหรับอ่าอ่าคนที่มาฟังวันนี้บางคนอาจจะยังไงฟังบางช่วงบางตอนติดขัดไปหรือว่าสนใจนะครับก็คอยติดตามนะครับทางเพจสโมสรนิสิตรัฐศาสตร์จุฬาขอบคุณครับขอบคุณครับขอบคุณครับสวัสดีครับ